Hi, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Muirhadi, and on behalf of my family, um, some part of it uh, is, is here. Um, uh, welcome to this talk. Um, I have a couple of responsibilities. One is to ask people to turn off their cell phones. Um, and so I've turned mine off already. Um, and the, the second one thing I'd like to do is just um, to make mention of the fact that this lecture series, which we've been enjoying for the last 17 years, is really the result not only of my parents um, who, who wanted to see this happen and wanted to see this activity um, happening, but especially the work of Daryl McLean, who uh, in December will be retiring from Simon Fraser University. So this will be the last Mirhadi lecture that he's able to attend while still a member of the faculty. And um, the vision that he has had in putting this together, in developing, the, uh, helping to encourage the Persian language programs, um, to establish the, the Center for the Comparative Study of Muslim Cultures, um, that embraces also his colleagues who, who work on the Arabic world and the Turkish world. Um, this, um, this has really been a, a tremendous accomplishment. And, um, and I know that he has sacrificed a great deal of his own academic energies to put into these organizational things um, that we've all benefited from. And, and so for that, I wonder whether we could all just quickly say thank you to Daryl. <laughs> Normally at this point, I introduce an administrator, a president, a vice president, a dean. None of them are attending this evening. But I can introduce my colleague, Thomas Kuhn from the history department, who will introduce our speaker. Thomas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming. Um, I am, unlike Adele McLean and our speaker, Dr. Amanat, I'm not a historian of Iran, but a historian of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and um, uh, as sort of uh, someone who comes from the borderlands of the, uh, the Persian world, it has been always a very, very uh, great pleasure to attend and help organize the lectures uh, that uh, the Mehadi family has so graciously, so generously uh, sponsored. And I should also um, emphasize here that this is not um, one of our regular uh, Mehadi lectures. We have another Mehadi lecture coming up at the end of February in 2019, but this is a very special event, um, partly in, in honor of um, uh, my colleague Daryl McLean, but partly also because we saw with the publication of Dr. Amanat's new book, um, Iran and Modern History, um, an opportunity to do more than we've usually done. So this is an uh, additional event. This is a um, uh, something that's uh, uh, above and beyond uh, our usual yearly program. And uh, if you uh, want to uh, hear more of the scholarship uh, of uh, Dr. McLean and Dr. Amanat and of our colleague uh, Dr. Mojtaba Mahtavi from uh, University of Alberta, uh, there is a workshop here in this building on the seventh floor uh, tomorrow afternoon between two and five in a um, smaller circle, but uh, definitely open to the public, so this is something that um, uh, you should not forget. So we are very fortunate here uh, to have as our speaker uh, Dr. Abbas Amanat uh, tonight. Dr. Amanat um, was educated at the University of Tehran and at Oxford University, where he received his DPhil uh, in history in, uh, in 1981. And for a very, very, very long time, he has taught uh, the history of Iran and the modern Middle East at, uh, at Yale in, uh, in New Haven. Um, unlike uh, some of the um, historians uh, 
of Iran, of an earlier generation, people like, for example, Hans-Robert Römer and, and others, um, uh, Dr. Amarnath uh, has never settled in any particular period of Iranian history. He never became uh, just a pre historian of pre-modern Iran or historian of, of modern Iran. He has uh, sort of gone back and forth uh, between these two um, uh, long periods of more than 500 years and um, his, his interest has spanned millenary movements, religion and politics, society and, uh, and political transformation and he started with um, a path-breaking study of the, uh, the origins of the Baha'i movement in the early 19th century. And he stayed with his second book, um, Pivot of the Universe, on the early period of um, uh, the Iranian ruler Nasseruddin Shah in the 19th century. And uh, in doing so, uh, he helped create a body of work that went a long way to putting the history of Qaja Iran, the 19th and early 20th century, back on the map of uh, world history and Middle East historical scholarship. And um, it is very impressive to see not just uh, the many books, articles, edited collections uh, that um, Dr. Amanat has produced and helped produce, but equally the very large number of PhD students who are now professors who have uh, monographs published uh, who became historians of Qaja Iran uh, that um, was very, very much and for a very long time underrepresented uh, in the scholarship of the modern Middle East. Now, um, in, with the history of modern Iran, uh, Dr. Amanat has pulled together a lot of scholarship and has sort of done what um, other uh, renowned historians of the period of the, uh, the, the region have done at some point in their careers, like for example, Albert Hurani with his uh, history of the Arab peoples, namely try to create a very large interpretative cam canvas that pulls together multiple strings of um, events, developments, and processes over the better part of 500 years. And it's in part on um, uh, his book, published to great acclaim uh, last year with Yale University Press, uh, that um, Dr. Amanat is drawing today um, in his lecture titled Iran's Two and a Half Revolutions, Tragedy but No Farce. Join me in welcoming Dr. Abbas Amanat. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn, and uh, the audience um, who flattered me this evening. I can see a large audience here. You can hear me at the back? Okay, great. Um, I know Friday evenings are a uh, very exciting time in a cosmopolitan city like Vancouver to do other things. So, um, uh, Instead, coming to this lecture here to hear about Iran, more specifically about Iran in the 20th century, and even more specifically about Iran's two and a half revolution, that other half I added in order to add to the curiosity of my audience. <laughs> and uh, with the introduction that uh, Dr. Kuhn presented us, uh, I feel very flattered, and I think I have to work very hard to try to convince the audience to purchase my book. <laughs> so um, I probably should ask him to write that down so I can carry it around with me uh, as kind of a testimony, um, as people would used to do in the past. Um, all right, uh, about my lecture. Um, first of all, my thanks are due uh, to the organizers, to the Mirhadi family for the sponsorship of this lecture series. That's the second time I'm coming uh, to Vancouver and presenting in uh, uh, Simon Fraser University and uh, in Mirhadi lectures. This is an extra one, so it's an even 
a greater uh, uh, um, honor for me. Um, as some of you might know, uh, next year is the 40th um, anniversary of the revolution of 1979. Uh, four decades past an event that um, in many respects has not only transformed Iran for better or for worse, in the view of many for worse, but revolutions are revolutions, and uh, uh, also had an impact uh, globally. Uh, indeed, 1979 should be considered as a turning point in the history of the Islamic world for the emergence of what we can refer to as radical Islamist, Islamism or radical Islam in one form or another. And uh, uh, certainly the paradigm of the Iranian revolution played a very important part in the emergence of this new trend. However, as I have argued in my book, Iran seems to have passed uh, the period of uh, intense Islamification, and probably now we are facing a society, if not a state, that is probably moving away from that uh, uh, revolutionary paradigm and uh, try to probably create a new uh, society with new ideals and new visions, sometimes surprising to all of us as outside there outsiders who um, encounter uh, some examples of ch these changes both uh, within Iran and outside. For many, uh, the occurrence of the Islamic Revolution, or what I might say actually more accurately, 1979 revolution, uh, has been interpreted as probably a providential punishment some uh, ill fortune that uh, struck Iran, perhaps due to some conspiracies of foreign powers. Uh, and uh, probably for a fewer as part of a historical process. And that's what I'm trying to do, to try to show that whether we can place or position um, what happened in 1979 in the broader context of Iran's history um, uh, over the whole 20th century. Uh, I'm not trying here to assess the global impact of Iran, uh, just refer to it, or to record the Islamic Republic's uh, performance or uh, even the empirical causes of the 1979 revolution, which requires perhaps more than one lecture. And for those of you who are interested, there are four chapters of my book that is actually devoted to the subject. And uh, hopefully, for those of you who are in search of a more historical approach, that uh, may be an interesting reading. Uh, my book, perhaps I should say a few words about it uh, before I move on specifically talk about the question of revolutions. And then, of course, later on show you some slides. I'm not particularly good at coordinating between images and uh, uh, presentation. So you have to bear with me. I'll talk, and then I'll show you some images. Um, the book that was uh, referred to, uh, Iran in Modern History, actually is an attempt to try to look at the longer uh, process, as Dr. Kuhn pointed out, uh, from uh, uh, the rise of the Safavid Empire and the establishment of Twelver Shism as the official religion of the state in uh, 1501, uh, and uh, covers five centuries. Uh, it's not a surprise that it uh, eventually came out to a thousand pages, and it wasn't my intention to write that larger book, but you know, that happens. So, um, covers uh, basically this consists of four parts. 
there is a, a part on the rise of the Safavid Empire and its development in the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, the early modern period. Moves on uh, to the second part, uh, the uh, post-Safavid and the Qajar period that brings us to the Constitutional Revolution at the turn of the 20th century. But a chunk of the book, really, uh, that consists of two-thirds of it, uh, is devoted to the events of the 20th century. Again, it was not my intention to write so massively about the 20th century. But Iran's history in the 20th century is eventful. And uh, much of the events of the period is closer to the minds and the hearts of many people that are interested in Iran uh, since uh, it consists of two and a half revolutions. Uh, altogether, 12 or 13 chapters are devoted uh, to the 20th century. And the rationale for uh, this kind of uh, engaging this massive, long period, very eventful period uh, in Iran's history uh, partly was the fact that I could try to identify certain uh, long-term trends or binaries in the history of uh, Iran. Uh, like, of course, many other empires of the early modern times, but perhaps a little bit more pronounced in the case of Iran. Uh, I can mention a few of these themes, uh, those that are more particularly corresponds to the question of the emergence of two and a half revolutions in the 20th century. Perhaps the most uh, 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 important in terms of uh, the event events of the 20th century, the interaction, uh, coexistence, or their lack of relationship between the state and the religious establishment. Uh, the other major trend of the history of Iran in this period and earlier is the uh, tension between the institution of kingship and the institution of uh, ministerial power, that is the uh, administration of the state, what I would refer to is as the Darga and Divan. Divan is a reference to the administration. Um, also a very uh, uh, visible tension within uh, the um, uh, phenomenon of Shiism in Iran and uh, even from the pre-modern times, but certainly in the course of the early modern and to the 19th and the 20th century, are the two most of the time um, conflicting uh, tendencies, one towards a, one we would refer to as messianic, or in Persian and Arabic probably Mahdavi form of Shiism. Uh, which emphasizes it usually is a religion of dissent against the uh, religious establishment, against sometimes against the state. And uh, the other is the what uh, sociologists of religion would refer to as normative uh, religion or the religion of orthodoxy that, at least in the Christian context, we can refer to as orthodoxy, perhaps in Islam too. Uh, which is the religion of the religious establishment, the clerical establishment. That tension also persists uh, throughout this period. And after all, the rise of the Safavid Empire is the product of one of these messianic movements. Uh, also, we can speak of uh, a tension or a binary again between what we would refer to as Iran and uh, the concept of an Iran, non-Iran, with its origin going back to the Book of the Kings, the Shahnameh, and numerous examples of this tension between within Iran and outside Iran, that uh, uh, it's not unique, of course. Many of the empires, many of the communities, political communities, in uh, encounter or produce the same kind of a force of othering that they have a self and the other. And in the case of Iran, it seems to be in particularly powerful force. Uh, 
the way that Iran tends to regard within and without as two entities. Although it's in practice very porous, there's much of back and forth exchanges between the inside and outside. But conceptually, these two entities always stand against each other or tend to be in a certain degree of tension. Just to give you an example, in early modern times, since we have here an Ottomanist with us, uh, the Ottoman Empire is indeed that other, that an Iran, that uh, in not only in terms of territorial tension, territorial competition with the Safavid Empire, but more significantly in terms of the uh, uh, division between Sunni Islam and Shi Islam became much more pronounced and is part of this uh, idea of the self and the other, the Iran and an Iran. Of course, the concept of an Iran means non-Iran. There is nothing particularly pejorative about it, but that's what it turns into as a kind of a tension between the self and the other. Uh, more so is the idea of the center and periphery that in my book I have paid a fair amount of attention. Again, in Persian, this idea of a boom va bar. Boom meaning the center and bar meaning the frontier. So not only Iran has a self and the other with the outside, but it also has a certain tension within its frontier world and its central world, mostly urban center and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, nomadic or uh, semi-nomadic periphery. And that played a very important, significant part in the course of Iran's history all the way to the early 20th century. Perhaps the last example of that tension comes through in the course of the constitutional revolution in the early days, in the early decade of the first decade of the uh, 20th century. Uh, again, uh, the tension between exterior and interior, uh, that is uh, Birun and Andarun, uh, both spatially it's very important in the way that it is reflected in the, uh, uh, in the imagination of the uh, inside and outside in the architecture, for instance, but it has also a deeper meaning in terms of the uh, presence of a patriarchy as an outside, as an exterior force. And we did, it's usually the presence of a matriarchy or the presence of the women, in a sense, in the interior, in the Andarun. And this tension between the interior and the exterior also plays an important part in the political history of Iran, as indeed for many of the other countries of the region. Mughal Empire in the early modern times, Ottoman Empire in the classical period, both experienced this kind of a tension between the inside and outside. Uh, uh, moreover, we can mention one phenomenon that perhaps it's a little bit more specific to Iran, and that's the kind of a, a tension or duality between the bazaar as the space that is dominated usually by a mercantile class and their associates, the guilds, and the space that it's more in the control of the state and that's Maidan. Both of the terms are old Persian terms and both of them play the conceptual uh, part in the shaping of Iran's economic history. And not only economic history, but in the way that the bazaar has always, uh, not always, but in moments of crisis, really resisted the domination of the Maidan. Uh, more so about the idea of the subjects and citizens. This is also a process that we can see the, from the concept of a rayat to a concept of a melat, uh, a nation. And that, of course, you can witness it in most new nation states of the Middle East and beyond. But in the case of Iran, also involves a certain degree of complexity that has to do with the long history of the way that the Iranian state dealt with the uh, subjects, the raya, of uh, its own uh, empire, and the way that it, the idea of the empire in the center versus the periphery was maintained. Uh, we should make a reference, for instance, here to the idea of the 
the traditional concept of Iran as a, a guarded domains of Iran or guarded domains of Persia, Mamalek Mahrusay Iran, which was the official title of Iran, as it was the official title, I presume, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the concept that an imperial model consists also of a kingship in the center and the raia actually basically in many smaller entities uh, as uh, uh, the mini states that it's under the control of the center. That's why it's referred to as the guarded domains. It's not one domain, but it's a group of domains. It was a very old uh, and probably can be said um, pretty much a Persian model that throughout the history of pre-modern times, uh, ever since the Sasanian era, has uh, been the dominant form of the structure of a state and its relationship to its subjects. Okay, um, what I've also tried to do in this book, in addition to paying attention to these ma major themes, and also following a certain chronological order, as it is moves from the Safavid to the post-Safavid to the Qajar to the Constitutional Revolution to Pahlavi era, and eventually to the revolution and the post-revolutionary era, I have also tried to break uh, certain barriers or divisions that it's often with, uh, at least in the older generation of historiography, has been, uh, has been honored. And that is the division between perhaps political history, socioeconomic history, cultural history, religious history, or religion as part of the cultural history. Um, perhaps uh, for a, a long-term, kind of a long durée, uh, uh, to use the French term that, was very, that is popular by some school of historians in uh, France, uh, the idea is actually to introduce these various features, both political, socioeconomic, and cultural, in order to give a better understanding of the, uh, uh, of the trends in the period, of the subtext of the changes in, uh, uh, in political sense. So uh, in, in, in the book, in my book, you would see that there is plenty of references to history. Uh, I'm sorry, plenty of references to poetry, uh, literature in general, uh, to uh, various forms of artistic expression, later on to cinema, uh, uh, late, uh, uh, as far as possible to music. Uh, so all of these are incorporated to the story of Iran, the way that it was told in this book. And therefore, it's not surprising that it reached 1,000 pages. Now, back to my uh, topic. Uh, why this title? Uh, that is Iran's two and a half revolutions, tragedy but not farce. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, famous saying by Karl Marx um, about the two Napoleons. Uh, he makes a, uh, a f the famous quotation by Marx is, history repeats itself. The first as a tragedy, then as a farce. And by this, he made reference to Napoleon's the first famous coup of 1804 as the beginning of the emergence of the French, French Empire as the tragedy. And then, of course, to the 1851, um, December 1851, um, the coup by Louis Napoleon, Napoleon the, the, the second, who is referred to as uh, uh, a farce, or considered as a farce by, by, by Marx at the time. This appears in a newspaper, curiously enough, in, the, in New York, where uh, Marx was contributing to. How does it apply to the, to the history of Iran in the 20th century? Do I mean that the Constitutional Revolution was the tragedy and the, the two other events of the mid and the late 19th century were farce. 
That's why I've actually used tragedy but no farce. And could have been in front of it a question mark. And I'm not quite sure to what extent it was actually a farce. I, in my opinion, um, as I have indicated in the book, uh, perhaps they were all tragedies and there were no farce. Why this is so? First of all, what are Iran's two full revolution and that half revolution? The first one is very obvious. The turn of the 20th century Iran witnessed a democratic revolution in which the major objectives were to create a, um, a representative government with a parliament, with elections, uh, with uh, representatives from various classes uh, to try to create, as the name of the um, uh, revolution implies, to uh, forge a constitution and uh, set about a move that would bring the society into a new uh, 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 kind of a vision very different from the old model of kingship in the past. Uh, and Iran was not the only country. A year later, there was 1908 Young Turks Revolution uh, in China. There were similar trends. In Europe, there were similar trends at the turn of the 20th century. But the Iranian case of uh, 1906 to 1911, as it's usually been period, uh, the period uh, uh, referred to as the Constitutional Revolution, Mashrutiyat, that is, it's significant because, uh, uh, for one thing, it's a, a popular revolution. That is, the uh, popular participation in this revolution is uh, somewhat unique compared to other examples of its time. Uh, at the turn of the, the 20th century, this was an, a movement that was not involved only as group of elites in the society, but it actually involved everyday people. People in the bazaar, the uh, craftsmen in the guilds, uh, the merchants, uh, dissidents, uh, uh, as well as the part of the religious establishment of the time, all participated in the constitutional movement. Uh, Perhaps even a group within the, within the government elite also joined the constitutional revolution. In that regard, it was a remarkable event. Uh, the second one, which actually constitutes that half revolution, and I would explain in a moment why I would con con consider it as a half revolution, is the national movement of the 1950s. Uh, that is largely from the end of the Second World War and the end of the occupation of Iran, or partial end of the occupation of Iran, in 1945, up to the infamous event that it's referred to as the coup of 1953, uh, the period that it's also known as the oil nationalization movement of Iran, and particularly associated with it very closely with Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh as the leader of the movement. The third one, actually, I can speak of two half revolutions. Because, as I said, Iranians seem to have a particular uh, fund for uh, the concept of the revolution. Uh, we can, even the events of the Shah's period in the 1960s, referred to as the White Revolution, largely um, uh, uh, important for the land reform, but also in other respects. And in that regard, probably even the White Revolution, in terms of its long-term effect, was far more important in changing Iran than perhaps any of the other events that I refer to. Uh, the last one, of course, is the Islamic Revolution of what's referred to nowadays as the Islamic Revolution of 1979, and comes all the way as it has tried to cover it more systematically up to 1989, the first phase of the revolution. As I said, it's a rare event for any country to have two revolutions in one century. Perhaps the only one that I can remember is China, 
that experienced two revolutions in the course of one century beside Iran. Well, if you can say that what Europeans would refer, European historians would refer to as the long 19th century, then you can include France because the revolution of 1789, revolution of 1848, all can be considered as part of a long century. But it's usually uh, is a rare phenomenon. Uh, and uh, as I've tried to point out, uh, in the book, in a sense, each of these events, uh, if these upheavals, political and for that matter, one might say, might say socioeconomic upheavals, were the product of one generation. So we have these three events in the course of the 20th century reflecting three generations. Perhaps the generations of our grandfathers, grandmothers would remember the events of the turn of the 20th century and at least the consequences of the Constitutional Revolution that led to the emergence of the Pahlavi era, First World War and then Pahlavi era. Uh, the generation of our uh, mothers and fathers would remember the events of the Second World War and the post-war era, that's the period of the national movement, perhaps even in the memory of some people in this uh, room, uh, there are some uh, distant memories of their youth or their childhood, including my own perhaps to some extent, whereby you can still remember the entail of the movement of the 1950s. And uh, of course, the, uh, the revolution of 1979, which is uh, for a generation that was born uh, uh, perhaps from the 1940s and 50s and 60s, is a very lively uh, 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 memory. And of course, for those who were the product of the post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, let me say a few things. Uh, uh, first of all, as I said, Iranians seem to be very prone to the revolutionary ideas. And that's not an exaggeration. If you look back, even in the Shahnameh, I believe that one of the earliest examples of a revolutionary model appears. The reign of Zahak, uh, the uprising of Kaveh, uh, the charismatic emergence of Feridun, uh, that is uh, indeed a very typical model of a, a revolutionary movement, although in the Shahnameh it's not uh, really conceptualized as such. There is no term for it per se. Um, whereas later on, of course, Iranians in the Islamic period in pre-modern times gradually became more conscious of the concept as a turn that would bring major change into the political system and the society. First with the concept of dola or dolat, which means fortune, but it basically means in the case of the Abbasid, uh, Abbasid revolution of 750, as a turn of events that puts the, uh, uh, brings down the ruling uh, dynasty, that's the Umayyads and the rise of the Abbasids as the change. This is the first concept that consciously in the Islamic world, the notion of the revolution was, uh, was, uh, was understood. Later on, of course, uh, the other concepts in this Shi context, the messianic revolution at the end of the time, this apocalyptic event at the end of the time is referred to as the Fetna or Fetne in Persian, which these, these days were very much abused in the Islamic Republic, but in a sense it's just the uh, events that precedes the coming of the 12th Imam, the Mahdi of uh, Shiism. Uh, you can always uh, find other uh, uh, concepts associated with it. Um, even into the 20th century, the concept of nehzat or nahzat is one that sometimes for more conservative uh, trends in the uh, uh, Iranian, uh, uh, conserv cons conservative sectors in the Iranian population was referred to as nahzat. Even the constitutional revolution for a long time referred to as Nahzat-e-Mashrute and not as Engelab-e-Mashrute. Um, 
And some of you may remember that in the early days of the revolution of 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini still was referring to us to Nahzat Meli or Nahzat Islami, and then gradually changed his uh, uh, rhetoric to become an Engalab. The term Engalab is interesting because to my knowledge, it seems that uh, the term that uh, was uh, had its life of its own in the Iranian environment, uh, as it's referred to celestial heavenly changes, and perhaps to the climatic changes, that is referred to as envelop, meaning a, uh, a revolving of the uh, weather or heavenly changes according to the shift in the stars, but then it was gradually um, um, materialized in the form of a uh, political revolution and used for the first time, actually, in the case of the Constitutional Revolution in 1909 during the famous civil war known as the Estebdad Sarir. It's the first time that we hear mostly from the left of the constitutionalists to refer to the event as a, as a, as a revolution. Then, of course, in the 1950s, as some of you may be familiar, 40s and 50s, and afterwards, this became part of the discourse of the left, particularly the two the party who looked up into the revolution in, uh, the, in uh, Bolshevik Revolution in uh, Russia and the emergence of the Soviet Union. And that concept became much more as part of the aspiration of the Iranians towards the creation of an ideal society during to the, uh, according to the, uh, to the ideals or the uh, communist ideals. It's curious that Iranians never adopted the term Sora uh, in Arabic, or uh, uh, I believe it's in Turkish Devrim, the, uh, the circle, uh, in um, their use of the term uh, for uh, revolution. Um, but he maintained this kind of an idea that uh, eventually there would be a revolution that would change the society for the better. Uh, if you look at uh, four persistent themes, how much more time do I have? 15 minutes. So probably I should be very brief with my description because I want to show you some of the slides as well. One characteristic of uh, uh, the idea of revolution that all these movements that I've referred to share is the idea that uh, there is going to be a kind of a charismatic return, as I've just pointed out in the case of Feridun in the Shahnameh, that uh, a kind of a Mahdistic, uh, messianic figure and savior that would bring uh, change to the society. And that became, over the course of the 20th century uh, stronger. Curiously enough, if you look during the Constitutional Revolution, that concept was uh, some, somewhat less pronounced, although many elements that participated in the Constitutional Revolution were, in, uh, were inspired by the concepts of the change, of messianic change in, in the society. And of course, Iran, uh, because of its pre-Islamic, or at least I believe to some extent its pre-Islamic uh, memories, uh, the concept of this kind of renewal uh, is a very strong one. The concept that in Zoroastrianism referred to as farashkard, or farashkard, that is the shift that comes with the sociant, so the uh, uh, Zoroastrian Mahdi, or the Zoroastrian Messiah, savior, shifts the world or change the world. And that concept also gradually incorporated into the Shi'i thinking about the idea of a, a messiah. And that is pr uh, profoundly important for understanding of Iran. After all, as I pointed out, the uh, uh, revolution of the Safavid era was the product of this kind of notion of a, a messianic uh, savior. What else is important is that what I just pointed out, this popular participation. And the third is that in all these trends of the 20th century, one can see there is a, 
uh, almost a failed struggle against uh, forms of modern authoritarianism, or one might refer to as the strong state. The 20th century began gradually to, in Iran to experience the shift from that old model of kingship that was popular or was in practice in Iran for a very long time to a new form of uh, government. And that for a reason, uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, power of the state over the course of the 20th century gradually increased. Part of it due to the fact that the state no longer was uh, entirely dependent on forms of revenue raising or taxation that depended its power upon its own population and more relied on what one may call a, an extracting economy. That's an economy that basically relies on a resource that comes from some other source, in this case, in the Iranian case, the petroleum. That that kind of, even if the degree of reliance on um, uh, a degree of the revenue from the oil industry up to 1960s and 70s was still limited. Nevertheless, but sufficient enough to make the state far more powerful than it used to be in the past. That's what we see as the result of the Constitutional Revolution. Many of the changes that comes about in the Pahlavi era are really objectives that is strong space, a strong state can implement. Centralization, unification of the armed forces, pacification of the periphery, uh, communication and uh, uh, railroad as the most important element of it, public education, uh, a form of uh, nationally, uh, uh, forms of na uh, state sponsored nationalism as a cultural factor. All of those are elements that comes with this strong state, which is the form of modern state that you cannot envision in pre-modern times. There are some, of course, resonance of that in the earlier times, but in the form that it's very consciously emerges as a product of the 20th century. And these revolutions, ever since the constitutional period or the 1950s, or the revolution of 1979, in a sense, was an attempt to regulate, to control, and rationalize the power of the central state. And in most cases, the attempt, by and large, was uh, not successful. As we can see in the uh, case of uh, Constitutional Revolution after 1910, 1911, 1912, or in the case of the 1953 in the National Movement, or in the case of the what emerged out of the Islamic Republic of, uh, out of the revolution of 1979, the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. In all these three, the form of authoritarian state tends to become very uh, more reinforced, more powerful as a result of the revolution. If you look to take the case of the Constitutional Revolution, during the Constitutional Revolution, there is an element of the outside intervention, and that's another characteristic that's shared between all of these. Uh, all of them, in effect, were uh, influenced by a certain force from the an Iran, from the outside. Uh, in the case of the Constitutional Revolution, we can very clearly see the intervention of foreign powers, in this case, Tsarist Russia and the British Empire, that virtually brought, uh, by 1911, the end of 1911, beginning of the 1912, the constitutional regime to an end. They forced the Iranian government, basically, to close down the Majlis for reasons that are complex, and I invite you to read my book on that, what I would call probably the most tragic example of how Iran has been affected by the presence of these foreign powers in its frontiers. Uh, the case of the 1953 or 45 to 1953 is very well known, and I need to um, uh, go back to this virtually old notion of how the Americans and the British basically brought about a certain force into the Iranian uh, system that led to the collapse of the 
presumably democratic regime in power. Although my chapter on the uh, revolution, uh, on the uh, oil movement, um, questions many of the conventional notions that Iranians tend to particularly enjoy in reference to uh, the intervention from the outside force, which is nowadays becomes a part of the rhetoric of the Islamic Republic. And uh, of course, in the revolution of 1979, that's the most interesting. Because in this case, in effect, the Islamic Republic actually invented an other, an in foreign intervention, the creation of the uh, concept of the great Satan, in my opinion, was an attempt to have this kind of an other enemy outside to which uh, by, by creating that enemy outside would tend to further reinforce the sense of the uh, solidarity within uh, Iran and for a time proved to be successful. Uh, whether that rhetoric is now no longer as effective as it used to be in the past is uh, something for us to, uh, to uh, deal with in future. Finally is the question of demographics. Uh, if you compare, although all of this were popular participation was very evident, if you look at the figures about the population of Iran, one can understand why a revolution had much greater impact on the society than it was in the earlier times. And during the Constitutional Revolution, the population of Iran was something around 9 million. Uh, by 1940s, early 1950s, 16 to 17 million. By the time of the 1979 revolution, 35 million. And by today's, I believe it's 83 or perhaps above 83 million. So the growth of the population completely changed the nature of the society that was involved in the political process or tend to uh, aspire to become involved in the political process. Also, one should bear in mind that the process of modernity changed uh, in, the, in the Pahlavi era. Uh, the emergence of the new institutions of the state tend to change the nature of the balance between the religious establishment and the state. As the state became more powerful, stronger, and incorporated many of the institutions of, uh, that previously were in control of the religious establishment, the clergy, such as public education, judiciary as the most important, these uh, and numerous other institutions, these became all uh, uh, part of the state uh, machinery and further and further basically isolated or took away the functions of the religious establishment in the latter part of the 20th century and pushed it into a position of isolation. A position of isolation that in effect by the 1970s, late 1970s, turned more radical or rather adopted a kind of a radical uh, a path in order to empower itself, in order to become more relevant again to the society, at the expense of not being able to actually uh, reform its own institutions. If you look at the message of the Islamic Revolution of today, of 1979 onwards, it involves mass mobilization. It involves the message that it incorporated from the West, uh, from, from the uh, anti-Westernism, uh, very popular in the 60s and 70s, uh, part of the rhetoric of the left, and incorporated that to its own vision or into its own message that tend to become very effective for a very uh, period of time. I would stop here and uh, make some conclusions at the very end, but I would like to show you some quickly some images because uh, perhaps it would help us to better grasp some of the things that I just pointed out. Okay, B. All right. What you see here, uh, I put uh, from the uh, legend of uh, uh, the uh, newspaper Surah Esrafil, uh, published in the 
constitutional revolution, this bearded angel that you see here is a seraphim. And uh, I'll show you later on, uh, perhaps I don't have an image. Uh, what you see here, what I was referring to, you see popular participation in the constitutional revolution in vast numbers. You also see the presence in the famous uh, uh, sanctuary bast in the compounds of the British uh, uh, legation in Tehran uh, that shows the, uh, the guild of the Clodiers in Tehran. So it's in interesting to see that this was not a population of the elite, but was the population of the ordinary people. Uh, participation of the ordinary people. Or, to, or the element of resistance, as you can see here, on the top left shows the famous popular hero of the Constitutional Revolution after the Civil War, Sattar Khan, with his, uh, with, uh, next to him is Bagher Khan, uh, and uh, their uh, fighters during the siege of Tabriz in 1908 and 1909, uh, that, in a sense, create some kind of a, a heroic uh, story of resistance against uh, uh, powers of the uh, of, uh, authoritarian state, or what they would refer to as the tyranny of the Qajar era. The picture on the right shows part of this martyrology. These are the examples of the martyrs, or those that were basically uh, the government of Muhammad Ali Shah Qajar put on chain, some of them were executed, and they became also part of this narrative of popular resistance against tyranny. Or, uh, as you can see in this uh, poster, based on a painting in the, uh, now I believe it's uh, in the uh, palace, uh, the, uh, the name of it escapes me, um, in Tehran, uh, whereby it portrays the uh, uh, arrival of the liberating forces at the end of the civil war of 1909 uh, with the two leaders in the center of it. Hopefully I would be able to show, yes. Uh, one being uh, Sardar Asad of Bakhtiari from the south as an example of a tribal power that comes to control the center, and the, on the right is Sardar Tone Kaboni, who was a major landowner from the north, who co uh, collaborated and together were at the base, where is the leadership of the resistance movement. Uh, the, 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 all of this, in effect, reflects with, with scenes of the wars that were fought during the Civil War. But moving on uh, to the 50s, you see also political participation, but in an entirely different uh, context. Here you see the left, uh, particularly in this case, the to the party as the major mobilizer of the general population. Of course, it wasn't the only one, but it was the most significant one in this kind of a popularization, uh, this kind of popular participation in the 50s. The act of against uh, bringing down, um, in this case, the um, statue of Reza Shah, or what you can see that eventually in the 1953 coup brought a group of the um, former Lutis, or whatever you would call them, the thugs headed by Shaban Jafari here as a representative of the change that was brought about. You can see here the way that the Tuda party uh, played a very destructive part in the way that uh, it portrayed the national movement as being nothing but a stooge of the Americans and the British. This is presumably Mossadegh. This is a feast in which some of the leaders of the National Front were portrayed playing for the, uh, uh, for the leisure of the Americans and the British. This is in uh, today newspapers in the 1950s. Or this one, or I'm sorry, 
or this one, as you can see here, again portraying Mossadegh as being played by uh, the Uncle Sam, and you look around the, uh, his hat. Or you can see the images of how uh, the uh, religious uh, members of the clergy became again uh, active during the 1940s and 50s. This is Ayatollah Abul Qasem Kashani, uh, here with Mossadegh in his uh, very typical uh, portrayal, usually in bed. And here, as you can see, with uh, the chief, ex uh, with the executive director of the Anglo-Iranian oil company um, at the time when he gradually shifted uh, from the support for the national movement to a, a neutral position and eventually to a pro-Shah position against the national movement. Or if we move further on, I just want to do some images of how changes came about in the 1970s. This is a, uh, a graphic work, a sketch by famous uh, graphist, uh, uh, graphic artist of the 1970s and 80s, uh, Ardeshir Mohasses, that lampoons the position of the Shah as if he seems to be uh, harnessed by uh, Europeans or by the Americans, by the Westerners. In this image, this is done just before the years of the revolution, 1976, 1977. Or the way that he portrayed uh, the popular movements with an Islamic kind of an environment around it. Of course, later on, Bahman Mohasis changed the name of many of these images that he had created at that period and this as well. Some of the images that was produced in order to show that what happened in the 50 years since the Constitutional Revolution and the presence of the mass numbers of people in the streets of Tehran at the time of the 1979 revolution. Again, the popular participation is so well evident or the messianic themes that we can see here. Uh, this is a famous image that everybody uh, is familiar with, but I put this uh, kind of an emergence of this savior figure in this context of a poster. Uh, that is one of my favorites produced in the early years after the revolution in which you can see the popular movement of the people was seen as, as a worldly, reflections of what it says, the uh, uh, revolution of the Mahdi uh, in, in, in the hereafter. So uh, the close association between the uh, action in this world and action in the other is emphasized, uh, and in which, of course, Khomeini plays the part of the Naeb Imam, or as the first religious uh, Shi'i figure ever referred to beside the, in the 12 Shi'ism at least, uh, that referred to as the Imam. Of course, he referred presumably to himself as Naeb Imam, but as far as his supporters are concerned, he was referred to as the Imam. So this is, again, part of this emergence of the uh, messianic undercurrent that with the revolution becomes more pronounced. Or as you can see in these popular uh, posters of the revolutionary time, particularly the contrast between the uh, uh, kingship and the religious establishment. This is a complete change from the position of the clerical establishment all through the history of early modern and modern times. In no, position, in no time in the history of Shiism, to my knowledge, any clerical figure aspired to take over the political authority. This is the first time in, the, in Iran's long history. It has never occurred before. And as a matter of fact, one of the major conclusions that one can make that now that this change has happened, that now the institution of kingship or secular authority no longer is in place and has been replaced by the clerical establishment, what would be the future of Iran? When the, when this, in a sense, the 
concept of the savior, Mahdi, has now been fully exhausted, what's going to be the future of Iran after the revolution of 1979. As you can see here, uh, the view of the left uh, about what had happened since they gradually, as you can see, lampooning uh, the Islamic Republic, the whole uh, executions of the 1979, 1980 to 1989, and this all being seen as a, um, as a conspiracy hatched by the Americans. This is how it was portrayed uh, in, in the picture. Or you can see here the kind of a fascination with, with uh, arms, with weapons, that became part of the characteristic of the revolution of 1979. You saw that earlier uh, picture of the constitutionalists also being in love with this uh, 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 firearms. But here, much more actually expressed, as you can see here, as Fayzieta Jomri Islami. So in the sense, the, uh, a clerical is, the clerical body now claims that their move from the Fezia, which is the school or the uh, uh, is a combination of schools in Rome, uh, into creation of the Jomburi Islami was with the help of a Kalashnikov. And that's why the way that this kind of a sense of violence has been expressed. Or in the two images that you can see, one by the left, the other one adopted by the Islamic Republic. Or even a figure such as Ayatollah Montazeri, who was portrayed as the more uh, moderate uh, wing of the uh, revolution, has been presented here in, during the Friday prayers with the Klashnikov in his hand as part of this image of uh, militant revolutionary Islam, and of course you can see the outcome of it in the very famous, paint, uh, very famous photograph of the executions of the uh, uh, nationalist Kurds in Pave um, in 1981. Or the creation of the uh, uh, outside enemy, or is it inventing basically a, a great Satan. As you can see here with the image of Emrika cannot do a damn thing, as a famous saying by Khomeini, Emrika is galati nemi tawanat bokonat. And the image of the women that were presented as the face of resistance uh, against uh, uh, a secular regime is a woman with a hijab. Or during the war, incorporation or exploitation, whichever you would like to call it, of uh, the story of uh, Karbala, the martyrdom of Karbala into, into, into the story of the war. Uh, these are part, part of numerous posters that were created at the time. Or as in this case, uh, uh, the way that uh, he, uh, large number of the youth were sent into the front to fight and die, as uh, many of them indeed uh, uh, were encouraged by the propaganda of the Islamic Republic, or the image of how the war represents Saddam Hussein as in this uh, combination of the uh, Americans, uh, the Russians, or the Soviets, and the Israelis, as is the creation of the three, and the only force that would lead with them, deal with them is the, uh, is the Islamic Republic. And what was the reality? This is the demonstrations in 1980, I believe, late 1979, in the Tehran uh, uh, University women uh, demonstrating against the enforcement of the hijab uh, and the famous saying uh, uh, either uh, hijab or uh, punishment as a result of it that brought about a new uh, kind of a 
success for the Islamic Republic and part of its actually image, part of its message of, uh, uh, of uh, trying to change the Iranian uh, society. Thank you so much. traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Zeyd Wangtud, and Coquitlam First Nations. Uh, and um, I don't know how this works, but <laughs> it's, on. it's on. It's on. Okay. So what I would ask you to do is, um, and uh, I would ask you to uh, to line up uh, behind the two aisle microphones. Uh, and I think Dr. Amanat is going to take uh, questions by alternating uh, between the, um, uh, the two rows of, uh, of people with questions. So the floor is open. So, go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Amanat. I wanted to ask you about your idea of the revolution producing a strong state and that idea of the strong state as being simultaneously an effective unified federal government but also authoritarian. Um, and that's interesting to me because it seems like in the Western mind if the revolution, like for example the French Revolution or the Chinese or, or Bolshevik produces an authoritarian regime, then it's been a failure in, in some sense. It is a failure. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, if you are the beneficiary of a uh, strong state that emerges as a result of the revolution, then you would consider it as a blessing. Whereas from the perspective of a liberal, uh, uh, democratic uh, advocate, uh, the emergence of the strong state, it's part of the tragedy. So that's what I was trying to point out, that indeed in all three cases, you can see that the emergence of a revolution basically led to uh, the emergence of a strong state. However, it should be pointed out that I'm not particularly blaming the political process. As I said, revolutions are revolutions. There is no way that one can, as a historian, claim that these revolutions could have been avoided. Many a times, of course, there is an element of accident. There is a, as we see around us even, accident plays a very important part how the political event shapes. Uh, so, uh, one cannot basically uh, condemn the movements uh, with the popular participation and the demand for the uh, uh, a more uh, just society uh, that it leads to the uh, emergence. The case of Western uh, revolutions to which you have referred, perhaps there is only one example uh, that is, uh, Americans would like to always refer to is the American Revolution, right. that in a sense does not bring about, that's also even questionable, but there is an, uh, that did not lead to the emergence of a more authoritarian state. Whereas in yeah. Europe, most of the time, the case of major revolutions all around the world, Vietnamese, Cuban, Chinese, all of these revolutions in the first phase of them, yeah. They are all kind of striving for greater liberal or uh, democratic regimes, but then, of course, gradually gravitate. In the case of Iran, in the case of the Constitutional Revolution, the, f the pressure was more from the outside than the inside. S s really, the First World War, now that we are celebrating or uh, commemorating its uh, uh, centennial, was a profound impact on the way that the Constitutional Revolution, if not failed, 
was uh, brought to a standstill and eventually led to the emergence of an authoritarian power. Uh, although many of the objectives of the Constitutional Revolution was incorporated into the uh, project of modernism of the Pahlavi era, particularly the early Pahlavi era. So uh, it's a very curious phenomenon. So in one way, it's a reflection of the aspirations of, uh, uh, of uh, general public. On the other hand, it's always a return to the previous pattern, which I think was very much emphasized because of the um, state's access to the uh, source of revenue, source of wealth, that it makes it more, far less accountable to its own population. So in a sense, going back to the state concept of the raia, it's no longer the, the citizens, they're basically subjects, again, of the state. I just wanted to comment that it seems like your subtitle is sort of a vindication of Hegel uh, against Marx and Engels, um, the lack of farce but history repeating itself in tragedy. Yes. Of course, modern historians now, they question that history would ever re repeat itself. That's a weak thing to, to, uh, not to get into. Yes, please. Uh, yes, turn? please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what I heard uh, was a kind of chronological history of Iranian revolution. But, but what I accept, expected was to analyze the, each re evolution and the evolution of the revolutions that we have first. And then why the failure of these revolutions? Well, as we know, the constitutional revolution, we have many kind of people. We have clerks, sure. we have uh, uh, normal people, we have the people in the state, we, we have, why we have failed? What was the role, the role of the clerks, especially? And because at the beginning, we know that they participate, and then after, after they know that, no, they are not going to be in the power, there is something else that will be substituted. Yes. So they, what they did, they were against their constitutional revolution. So sure. that's what I really expect, I don't know if it is in your book or not, to, to analyze this and the, to, to see the evolution of those <coughs> evolutions and exactly. the, the reason of the, yes. of the, the failure. Well, there is a process to all these revolutions, and there is much being written about it. There are numerous massive studies in European literature, European historiography, about the anatomy of the revolution, in which there are stages into it. In the first stage, it's a popular participation. The nature of the leadership has, has changes, how it devours its own children, and eventually ends up uh, in a uh, more authoritarian regime. In the Iranian case, when you refer to the Constitutional Revolution, I think one of the important features of it is that this tension between what was referred to as mashrutiyat, that term that was taken from the, uh, uh, from the late Ottoman era, uh, the concept of the Constitution based on the notion of the shart, that is uh, based on the idea of conditioning the power of the state, was something that was popularly accepted. Whereas at the same time, we witnessed, that's I think what you are referring to, at the same time, the clerical establishment came out with the term that is actually coined. It was no such a term before, as mashru'a. That it's yes. Sheikh Fazullah Nuri and some of his supporters, actually a fairly important body of its supporters. Majority of the clerical, members of the clerical establishment in the Constitutional Revolution were supporters of um, Sheikh Fazullah Nuri, not of the revolutionaries. The number of those who were in supportive of the revolution were far smaller, at least in the higher echelons. The lower preachers in the mosques or the, uh, or the students in the madrasas uh, or the lower rank of the uh, uh, Rose Khans, they were supporters of the revolution. But the higher ranks of the Mujtahids were against it, or became against it more and more. Why I'm bringing this up? Because this two concept of the Mashru and Mashruta was never resolved. So although Mashruta eventually, as the end of the civil war, by 1909, 
reinforced and took over Tehran and put an end to the idea of Mashrua, that concept survived. And it's not a su surprise to see that in 1979 it's re-emerging as a concept that it's actually a foundation notion for what the Islamic Republic is all about. That's the tension within the Shiism for the question of leadership, for the fact that it is this model of the savior, uh, 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 Mahdi, competed with the idea of a mujtahid. By the 1979, these two were incorporated into one. And that brought about the constitution, brought about the revolution of 1979 and its success. But success only to the extent that it took over the power, that it created a new model that broke, as I pointed out, the old uh, uh, coexistence between clergy and the state, that always they competing <coughs> with each other. There were turf war between the two of them, but it was never an existential fight between the two. They always, ever since it's an old theory that the two are the two brothers or two sisters, this old Persian theory of government. That concept now has changed. And the question of the modernity was not resolved. So we have in power a religious establishment that claims that it is creating a model of government which is ideal, but at the same time, it is incapable of modernizing <coughs> itself. It's capable of reforming itself. So in effect, radicalism replaced reformism. And that's what we would witness today in this tension between the state and the religious establishment. Another question, how do you relate this thing to the acknowledgement of the people the uh, how uh, because they were not educated, they didn't know what is constitution. They didn't know, uh, for yes. example, the constitution word coming from the Western countries. Yes. So how how we can relate all? Well, this actually, I have a full passage in my book about the fact <coughs> that we should not look condescendingly toward the aspirations of the people during the constitutional revolution, not knowing about Rousseau and Montesquieu and John Locke doesn't mean that they didn't have demands for social justice. And they had it in their own way. They had it in their own terms. And actually, it's quite remarkable. If you read the proceedings of the first majlis, this is 1906, 1907. If you read the proceedings of that majlis, these people that I showed you, those, uh, those clothiers, uh, soap makers, clothiers, uh, a uh, variety of other, I cannot remember all of them, that were represented in the majlis, their representatives would make demands on the uh, regime, very confused, very, very, the divisions of the, uh, of the forces is not very clear, but nevertheless, the demands are very, very genuine. So you cannot blame, I think this is a Western view to expect everybody to have a degree in political science in order to understand what constitution is all about. But it's in effect the way that people demanding from the authority to, uh, uh, to, to respond to their demands, to respond to their aspirations and their objectives, this, I think this is the concept <coughs> of constitution is all about. <coughs> Uh, thank you for the uh, informative presentation. We sure need further discussion of the Iranian temporary contemporary politics and history. Uh, so I was wondering, you have referred to the White Revolution as a reform yes. or half a revolution. You know, I recall that you know I was a, a late uh, you know um, a secondary student in Iran prior to the revolution, and in those years we had this. Uh, you know, white revolution as a textbook taught in the high schools and, you know, probably in the elementary schools, you know. So this was registered as a revolution, although the revolution yes. was not uh, carried to the end. You know, one reason may be that the Shah uh, was not himself in favor of the revolution, but it was somehow in imposed on him by the American administration to prevent a real revolution. So the Shah, which is normally anti-revolutionary, is now making a revolution, the Shah and the people together. Yeah. But notwithstanding the 
pillars of the revolution, the very advanced principles of that revolution, which were added over time. And finally, it was administration revolution, you know, anti-corruption and actually a very good reform it could be. If that could, was totally carried out, I mean, those great principles of the white revolution, do you think that could somehow prevent the people to go for the black revolution or the consequent you know, Islamic revolution if it was really performed? And I mean, you know, seriously, I mean, the only thing which was performed was the land reform, you know, and uh, that was something that the Shah, you know, himself was interested to break the large you know, landowners, you know, and satisfy the, you know, mass peasant population that they received the piece of sure. land. Sure. And, and I also need to really, um, I've been looking for reliable sources, you know, about the white revolution. I really couldn't find any. So sure. maybe during the break time, I really want to get your advice to see if uh, I can find any of them. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you so much for Thank a very you. important question. Because we didn't have really time to talk about why the white revolution probably is the most important development in the 20th century. These are unintended consequences of a series of reforms that was undertaken from uh, the top. That's a movement, is a revolution from the top. That, as you pointed out, actually was very encouraged by the Kennedy administration and uh, uh, brought about, as I said, un unintentional consequences. Most significant of this is the fact that the land reform resulted in the, uh, 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 in, uh, in, in the rise of a surplus population in the countryside that if you look at the figures are really staggering, uh, that the population that eventually in the course of the late 1960s and early 1970s moved from the countryside to the cities. The population that basically came to the streets in the 1979 are the product of the majority, are the product of the first or the second generation of the urban immigrants, people who came from the countryside to the cities. This was a huge change in the kind of a force that became available for any kind of an ideology. Secondly is that the improvement in health, I would call this post-antibiotic world, in which uh, the uh, mortality rates came down substantially all over the world, in Iran in particular, you can see as a result of the uh, better degree, or at least to a certain degree, a better degree of health measures that were taken by the central government, we can see a larger population survived. And Iran has a, uh, a very high uh, uh, birth rate during the late 1960s and all the way to the revolution of the 1970s. This 2.9, 2.5, 2.6 is now it's 1, uh, 1.0 or 1.1, if that. Uh, at the time, this high uh, birth rate tremendously gave growth to the population in the countryside as a surplus population who could not survive. The Iranian countryside could not, uh, could not uh, sustain. A high population in the countryside. They came all to the cities in search of work, in this, mostly in the service industries, because the, indus the uh, industrial sector could not absorb the entire growth of this population. And they needed housing, they needed education, they needed amenities, they needed a better life, and there were examples ahead of them, in front of them. They could see the new horizons that was not visible in the countryside. Now it is visible in the cities. And that helped moving toward a greater uh, radicalization of the general public. And the fact that the mosque became virtually the only, uh, or religious gatherings became the only uh, venue whereby these sentiments could find a certain direction when the state in the late Pahlavi period basically closed down all other possibilities. 
no political, genuine political parties, no free press, huge amount of intimidation among the general public, among the intellectuals, and the only avenue that managed somehow to survive through this period of uh, repression was basically the mosque. So that's the unintended consequence of uh, much more can be said about it. What's really the nature of the white revolution in the 60s was. So if you want to really, it may sound rather, uh, rather um, exaggeration and exaggeration extreme, but it's not. If you want to see who was the real force behind the 1979 revolution, it was the white revolution of the Shah that created that kind of a force. Otherwise, the cities had never been in a position, the middle class in the cities were far smaller than that huge population that came to the streets and demonstrated against the regime. This was the, the unfulfilled demand that was channeled through the religious establishment. Please, the gentleman on the right. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Amanat. Uh, you pointed out a very important feature of Iran's modern history, which is the lack of uh, basically linkage between the state and religious establishment. When we compare uh, the story of state building in Iran with perhaps the most similar case, closest case, which is like uh, state building Turkey under the Kemalist regime, we see that despite the fact that the Turkish regime was far more anti-religion than the Pahlavi regime, uh, sort of kept or maintained some sort of linkage with religion by creating this director of religious affairs, Dianat, and uh, shrewdly put uh, clergy on the payroll of the state. Basically, yes. they became clients of the state. My question is, why did the Pahlavi regime, which pretty much followed a lot of emulated, basically, the Kemalist model, fail to create this sort of linkage with Well, that's religion? a great question. Great question. And uh, with all my sympathies for the reforms of the Pahlavi period, which completely transformed the early Pahlavi period, which completely transformed Iran and created a middle class that did not exist, educated, secular, nationalist middle class, or with an idea of a national Iran in their minds. With all that credit that one can give to the Pahlavi regime, uh, it was probably in the case of Shi Iran much harder to try to implement that kind of a state control over the religious establishment. The, in the Turkish case, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn can correct me if I'm wrong, the whole uh, Ottoman Empire centuries ago has implemented control over the religious establishment that Qajar Iran never could do that. In effect, if you look at the origins of this division, it goes back to the early 19th century, the collapse of the Safavids, 18th century, and the rise of the Qajars in the 19th century, that these two institutions were separated from each other, and the state could not have as much control over it as the Ottomans did over their own establishment. Now, the second point, which is also, I think, is fascinating, what has happened after, what, a century of, or 80 years of Ataturk's uh, reforms. Here we are. Today's Turkey is a return back to a religious preoccupation with the religious ideas and sentiments. So the very force of the state from the top, even in the form that was implemented by Ataturk, you know, banning all the uh, religious schools, even Quran was not published for a time in Arabic, change of the script, all the changes that were brought about by the power of the state, eventually, uh, some decades later, uh, uh, could not be uh, maintained, sustained. Part of the reason for the same phenomenon to which I have referred, that is the population moving from the countryside to the cities. That's what you see in today's Turkey. That is the countryside population comes to the city. They are in search of an identity, and the identity emerges within the body of Islam. And particularly, it is stronger in countries who tend to experience a period of secularization more intensely. So more intense, more demand for return to a nostalgia of, the, of Islam. So 
that I think is, uh, is not a resolved issue, resolved uh, case in the Ottoman case. Although it remains to be seen, that's at, at least my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. In 1979, I was in Tanzania, and we were asking, why is Khomeini flying from France to Iran? I was wondering what, what was the impact of uh, uh, French government on, uh, on, on the Islamic Revolution. And there was a 10-year war between Iraq and Iran. Did, it, did patriotism really affect the, 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 the growth of the revolution? Sure. And anything that you want to talk about the White House preparing? Anything to do? With our down south, Washington, White House, they said next year will be a change in Iran. Do okay. you have any comments on that? Well, in my reading of history, it's very hard to find any evidence to show that there was an active uh, a plan or a design of any sort to bring about a revolutionary change in Iran from outside. There is no evidence whatsoever. And since historians are operating on what the evidence is available, I can see that there is nothing that supports the idea. Uh, this is very popular uh, among a certain sector of the Iranian society. With all due respect, because Iran has experienced in the past numerous examples of conspiracies, of interventions from outside, so it's very normal to try to think that there must have been a hands of the outsiders in the emergence of uh, the revolution in 1979. Uh, so I would say that's it. I doubt that there is any, uh, the S, indirectly, obviously. Indirectly, the uh, uh, Carter administration's human rights policies that was actually intended towards the Soviet Union had a secondary impact on the Iranian population who for the first time felt that there is, a reason, there is, a, uh, there is an open uh, space for them to express their uh, resentments about the policies, the authoritarian policies of the regime from the top. This nobody can deny. Uh, nor one can deny that during the war with Iraq, as you pointed out, the United States, the Reagan administration, out of the very bitter experience of the hostage crisis, uh, the whole propaganda of the great Satan, would take a very hostile action towards uh, Iran. Uh, in answer to your question, yes, there was support for it. I have a chapter in which there's a whole section how the United States actually supported Saddam Hussein in the war against Iran. How Iran managed to survive, that's actually quite a remarkable story. Because regardless of the fact that this is an Islamic regime in power, regardless of the fact of the nature, the very oppressive nature of the regime, all the violence that was involved, all the propaganda that was involved. Nevertheless, it's an interesting case that Iran managed to fight a war um, against Iraq and survive uh, even after eight years. And of course, it ruined the country, the, uh, at the leadership in, the, in Iran, Khomeini at the top of it, were responsible for a huge amount of economic, uh, demographic, and loss of the Iranians' resources. There is no doubt about that, that huge mistakes that he made during the course of the war, and he and his supporters, all the Khomeinis, that did so. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, Iran managed to survive, and this is a very remarkable feature. It did not bring about a total chaos within the country. It did not result in um, secession of the certain provinces of Iran in the south or in the north. Iran maintained its integrity which I would attribute to a culture of homogeneity in Iran that was reasserted, reinforced um, during the Pahlavi era. So we are indebted, in a sense, to the Pahlavi era for creation of an Iran that could survive against uh, a very challenging period of war against uh, the outside Iraqis and their supporters in the United States. 
or European powers for that matter. Please go ahead, that's your last question. Thank you, Professor Amanat. Uh, my question is, do you see any change coming in a, looking at Iran society as form of revolution during, again? During the? Looking at the society of Iran, do you see any change coming in form of revolution again? And uh -huh. how, oh, and, okay. and, <laughs> and as yeah, we- I have been criticized, actually. And, and as we seen the, the ugly face of clergy and the incompetence of running the country, do you think if the change comes, again, religious state or religious people has a share in the power to run the country? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For a great question and the actually good concluding point. Uh, I, am, I hope there is not going to be another revolution. Iran had enough of revolution. And it wasn't the outcome of it was not very encouraging. So one should not expect for another savior just uh, descending and bringing a message that would change Iran entirely. I think historians would like to think it's more of a process and it's evolution rather than revolution. And uh, of course, the record of this government in power uh, is not uh, at all impressive in every respect. Human rights, economic policies, relations with the outside world. In every respect that we look at it, the record is pretty dismal, uh, to say the least. But at least one can say that it's not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq, it's not Syria, it's not even Egypt. It's a country that still maintains a degree of stability and of course, some people criticize me that this is not stability, this is all repression. I tend to agree. Stability and repression seem to be part of this Iranian political culture for a very long time. <laughs> after, after all, uh, after all uh, there is a famous saying by uh, Ghazali, uh, the 13th, 12th century uh, theologian, Sunni, not Shia. Uh, and not a very particularly interesting figure, but um, very much, very much uh, 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 promoted by the Sunni establishment. Azali says, um, hundred years of repression, zolm, is better than one day of chaos. So this is the significance of how Maintenance of the society, even in a repressive form, authoritarian form, is better than uh, collapse of the law and or collapse of the order of the society. And I think probably this applies to many, in many ways, applies uh, to Iran. When you look around it, you look at the entire Middle East and what you see, uh, you see that kind of a world which either because of the domestic or because of outside pressures and dynamics has basically exploded. And in the case of Iran, it managed so far to survive. Uh, how this is going to play out in future, it remains to be seen. These days, there's so much irrationality going around uh, that it's difficult to say what's going to be the outcome of it. I say irrationality, not inside, but outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amanat. And before you go, um, let me remind you uh, that outside, um, Dr. Amanat uh, is going to sign copies of his book, Iran and Modern History, and we have uh, a number of copies also for sale, should you be interested, and I hope you are. Thank you very much. Thank you.